So uh, very welcome. Uh, this is a little project I started, like I told you, uh, and I would um, like to uh, what would like to know a bit more about your channel. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's called Sutra Veretros Twelve. Please uh, fix me, uh, correct me if I'm uh, singing. Yes, uh, this is just a nickname. Okay, so what's the Savretros? Savretros, correct me if I did wrong. No, it's okay. It's just a nickname. It doesn't uh, have anything more than, than that, you know? Okay. Um, so let me just um, ask you a few questions. Like, um, I'd like to know a bit more about you. Uh, for, for example, how did you begin to, to study about swords and history? Um, and also a bit of HEMA and other experiences you'd like to, to talk about? Yes. Um, my degree, my bachelor is on war studies, um, which is a degree on military history and uh, international relations also, and uh, a lot of um, insights on how warfare developed from ancient times until modern times. And um, um, after my degree on my own time, I specialized in studying Byzantine military history. Um, while while my, uh, I continued my postgraduate degrees studies in politics and international relations, but other than that, I have been um, studying military history of Byzantium uh, for quite a long, a long time now, since uh, 2004. Um, I also immediately, almost immediately, with uh, studying military history, I um, focused on um, the element of reenacting, mm. which uh, closely related to military history. And um, um, over the last five or so years, I was able to um, get involved uh, more energetically with uh, practically researching and reenacting uh, Byzantine military history. And on the sides of that, I, I became involved in uh, historical European martial arts as, as a way of, um, I started this as a way of um, practicing, of you know, um, doing my training and for fitness. <laughs> um, right. So on, on the sides of doing my um, be, um, passion, which is Byzantine military history, I started doing HEMA and then I got hooked on doing, you know, the spot. Uh, but it helped me quite a lot in many ways. I have uh, learned many new insights of uh, reenactment and experimental archaeology from uh, doing HEMA. Um, so when I started uh, developing my project, which is now currently I'm, I am developing a, um, an impression of a 14th century Byzantine um, heavy cavalryman. Okay. Um, on the side, on, as I was developing this project, I um, I found um, their sources to, I found it very, you know, interesting to try to build my things from my um, research from zero, read into sources, read into what is available to us not just copying existing uh, modern reconstructions, but try to uh, make it as close to sources as possible because we do have uh, enough um, primary uh, material that is uh, unexplored. It is yes. not a lot, but it is unexplored. And people focus on second hand interpretations instead of going to the sources and doing the study themselves. Um, so I decided to do the study on myself from zero, which 
takes time. Um, and in doing so, I decided to make a reconstruction of the 10th century Byzantine spa sword, Pathion, which yes. is, you know, from 14th century project, but because for a 14th century project, we already know that um, any Western European arming sword is, um, is proper to use. Um, I wanted to do this as a step of uh, my next project, which will be focusing on 10th century Byzantine um, impression. Um, so this is how I am today doing my YouTube channel. Um, I started, my first video was in December, last December, 2020. Um, I started it as a way to reach out to people to express myself on uh, Byzantine reenactment and why it is important. Um, in Greek, yes, but I also started to make videos in English because I think I have a lot to share with the English um, international audience. Yes, and uh, if you allow me, um, for example, I have a natural Portuguese, but uh, something I, I am ashamed to say this, but I only discovered about the, the Byzantine Emperor, uh, Empire uh, when I was around 20 years. And this was for me a shock because uh, in some countries, we are taught a little bit about the Roman Empire. And then after the Western uh, part um, dissolved, we don't focus about it. So I'm a bit, um, I don't know enough, but uh, I'm very uh, excited to learn more about the Byzantine Empire, um, um, about the culture, the weapons, and um, because there is a lot to, to, to explore, uh, not in, for example, for in Portugal, but also in other um, a, a bit of uh, parts of the world, because unfortunately, uh, I think our schools were not at that time, were not focused enough uh, on it. So um, that's why I really liked to see your channel um, and more in a bit, <laughs> for, and more in the future, I hope. Um, yes, of, uh, you, should, you shouldn't take it on yourself, so. Uh, um, that you found out about Byzantium so relatively late, as you described. But at the same time, I, I don't think it is uh, honestly, I like to downplay, you know, because people talk about Byzantium like, wow, this is a big thing, you know, um, uh, how we did, we don't, why we don't talk about Byzantium. Um, I don't think it, it, I don't mean to say that it is not important, but at the end of the day, it is just another part of Greek history. So I really understand that it is very normal for, let's say, some people in uh, other parts of Europe or other continents, it is very normal that visiting history is not their main priority in a curriculum, in school, you know, curriculum. So, okay, yes, Byzantium is, is very important because you need to go back to understand how modern European civilization began, mm -hmm. but, okay, yes, no big deal. We can do this now, okay? I'm not talking about you, but generally. And the reason why this is, uh, also, a reason why Byzantium is not very well known in modern times is also for a fault of, uh, of uh, Greeks themselves. Um, for a large part, modern Greeks have overlooked Byzantium and they have gone straight back to ancient Greece because uh, ancient Greece uh, geopolitically fits, you know, the um, agenda of the modern Greek state, that it is, you know, the continuation of ancient Greece, but there is a problem of how you connect two very distant parts in historical timeline without looking at what happened in between. 
So Byzantium is what happened in, in, in between ancient Greece and modern Greece. Um, so before we start uh, making, um, you know, corrections to other international audiences, why do you not study about Byzantium? No, I will say first to the Greek people, why do you not study Byzantium, you Greeks? So, parenthesis. Now move on to um, okay. the question. Uh, well, one, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, and uh, if you perhaps you could send me an email later, I would like to know uh, some uh, books and sources that we could see, because I do uh, uh, understand the problem, which is having second uh, hand sources, which uh, don't uh, can't always tell us the, 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 as best the, the, the story. So I would yes. like to know. I, I hope you know my already my already said uh, answers are enough for you. If you think I would, you would like me to say more, please uh, feel free to ask me. So I have two books yes. to, uh, of today. One book is about uh, military history um, as, as such, you know, definite, uh, strictly military history mm -hmm. as a subject. It is a book by John Haldon, who is a very important uh, Byzantinist of our time, and it's called Sewing the Dragon's Teeth. Hmm. Sewing the Dragon's Teeth. It is a book that looks at Byzantine strategy of the most uh, um, important, most uh, famous, may we say, uh, period of Byzantine history, which is 10th century and uh, 10th to 11th century, uh, which is the time of the uh, Macedonian dynasty with uh, emperors like Leo the Wise, uh, John Tsimiskis, Basil II, and uh, Nikiforos Phokas. It's the, the time when the Byzantine Empire of the Middle Ages shines at the most. Um, the Byzantines defeat enemies on multiple fronts, on the east, on the north, at the north. Yes. So uh, they fight multiple wars at the, with uh, many important um, enemies, strong enemies, like the Bulgarians, like the Arabs, who are, uh, the Arabs are on the decline. Nevertheless, they were always, um, a menacing threat at uh, the eastern borders. So the book focuses on the two military treatises uh, known as Tactica by Nikiforos Fokas mm -hmm. and Nikiforos Uranos. There is also another important uh, military treatise from that period by Leo the Wise. So we have three military treatises in a period of uh, less than 100 years which is very, very astonishing because uh, we have only other two surviving and important uh, to this day uh, military treatises. Maybe there existed more, but they didn't survive. Yes. For a period of uh, 1,000 and a few hundred years and uh, history, you have two um, military treatises scattered in uh, the time of Morris and uh, another one in the time of 11th century by Kekav Menos. And then you have three big tactica in only 100 years. So uh, John Haldon looks at uh, the two treatises by Nikiforos Uranos and Nikiforos Fokas, describes um, the army of the time, but uh, they also uh, in, incorporate elements of earlier periods of the Byzantine history, because um, the writers, the authors of those treatises were copying older existing uh, documents, and of course, adding uh, what was important for their own time. So this is showing the dragon's teeth. Mm -hmm. it, everything of uh, from what armor 
was um, used from um, chainmail, um, hobbits and hobbizons, from uh, lamellar ammo, everything with all the terminology, et cetera, et cetera. And then there is another book which is more mostly um, useful, but also, also equally important for general military history uh, studies, uh, students. It's a book by Piotr Grotowski, mm -hmm. uh, which is titled Arms and Armor of the Warrior Sense. Now, this is a book for reenactors. Uh, it is a thick book which looks at iconography, it looks at um, surviving art from the period of the Middle Byzantine period, but it goes not, it does not uh, necessarily uh, focus on 10th century. So it goes earlier and later. So it has a larger um, scope. Two parts of history, yeah. Yes. So uh, Arms and Armour of the Warrior Sense, it's the most, um, I would say, serious um, work, modern academic work on the big issue of uh, how do we interpret Byzantine sources like iconography, miniature art, uh, small um, um, small art like uh, cas ivory caskets and other things like um, archaeological artifacts of the um, um, it, it has a, a few um, archaeological artifacts of uh, like spearheads and sword, uh, sword blades from um, the wider um, area of Byzantium. So I, I think it has helped me a lot in answering uh, questions in my own research and also giving, giving me um, a foothold to move on to further my own research and try to uh, to open new um, avenues in how we want to reconstruct isn't mm. uh, uh, no, allow me to follow up a little bit of question um, yes not, not directly connected but might be uh, so in your in your opinion uh, what would be an event or a part of history that you think uh, should be more uh, looked at, uh, or it's something we haven't uh, yet known about, or an event, for example. Yes, um, you know, it doesn't. Um, it doesn't have to do with any any given point in time and space. It, what we we haven't looked at yet is uh, the mindset. Um, I wouldn't have to say that, uh, look at year um, 1115 to 1135 to see this exact development, or look at um, how, so no, no, this is not, we have, a, we have points like that, for example, the fall of, the fall of Constantinople in uh, 1204 was an important you know, um, watershed in what yes. we know yeah. for military history, for the development of armors and weapons. But um, I think what is more important at this stage for the, the development of modern Byzantine reenactment is to look at the sources in a different way. We look at sources trying to copy them literally. We look at sources like an like a fresco, like an geographical painting, and we try to interpret it in a literal way. But there are many problems with this approach. Uh, the most okay. evident problem is that we cannot always link what we see painted in an ancient medieval 
centuries old neural, we cannot always connect what we see there with actual archaeological artifacts. Sometimes we can, but most of the times, most often we cannot. And this creates a problem of reconstruction. How do you reconstruct something that you only have in two dimension depictions? How do you reconstruct it? I guess uh, reenactment is the one of our best uh, uh, ways to try and uh, um, better in, uh, understand uh, and understand what. Uh... So my my proposal is that we take um, the sources, the primary sources of art, and we try to connect it with anything that exists exists in in. Um, archaeological evidence, anything that we can find from that period wide, wider, like in all of Europe, um, from clothes to anything, to shoes, to um, footwear, mm. headwear, to anything. Do we see something on a Byzantine mural that can be linked to um, a finding in Slavic areas? in medieval Slavic countries or in Western European, like Spain, for example, or the, uh, the Iberian Peninsula. Why do I say this? The reason I say this is because then we can build up a thesis. We can build up a thesis whereby make a hypothesis that if, if we, um, take in account that trade existed, that uh, regional globalization had started to be um, embedded, then it is not um, very improbable, but rather probable that we can use this existing um, piece of weaponry or piece of armor to interpret um, an, an icon that we see in Mistras or in the um, monastery of Daphnio in Athens. So the, it's, it's, it's a different uh, approach. Instead of trying to um, recreate a piece of leather armor that appears to be leather, but we don't yeah. really know. It may be anything, okay? And uh, we see in uh, caves in Cappadocia, very strange depictions from the time of, actually the same time as uh, John Hardon's um, book is uh, describing, 10th, 10th and 11th century. So why do we bother uh, recreate or guess? Uh, yes. Bother only doing guesswork when we can do better, uh, we can do hypotheses with the more um, better ground. It's a uh, it, no, it is a great idea. It's, uh, I think it's the first time um, I heard this um, hypothesis, and I think it will be uh, very interesting to to see in the future um, because it's a very good, uh, very good idea. Um, yeah, and. Uh, but to feel well me, um, in that case, for example, I was uh, watching uh, one of your videos, uh, a bit more, a um, bit more focused on the uh, kite shield, uh, correct me the correct name. Um, and uh, this is a very, uh, probably cool, uh, simple uh, question would be, uh, based on this shield, um, why does this, this shield was um, used uh, by the Byzantines? when they had other styles of she, she, shields before? Was it tactics mm -hmm. or what was it? Yes. Um, well, the, the, the shape of the triangular shape of this shield, um, we see it depicted uh, rather early. It appears in Byzantine art rather early. Um, 
already from 9th to 10th century, we have this shape. Yes. That we call it triangular, but it's actually um, more like a, more like a development of the oval shield, whereby the the latter part, the latter corner of the shield yeah, comes. Uh, so you have you have the older, the original big oval scutum of the early Byzantine uh, soldiers, and maybe over time the 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 lower part the lower end of the shield became pointed this is one hypothesis it's not i'm not saying that this is necessarily how it happened yes um so we see this uh, shape appearing early on the problem is that we don't have um it is very hard at the at this moment to um find um sources for 10th century um, kite-shaped seals because we only, the only source we have is uh, that are some dimensions from Leo the Wise, Tactica. He, 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 he mentions some dimensions for, um, for a circular shield and a triangular shield. So he doesn't necessarily, um, refer to a kite shield. So there is a bit of a problem there because we do not have definite sources to base a reconstruction of the earlier period uh, over, um, sorry, kite, kite shaped. Yeah, which, which is a, a modern have, name. We only have miniatures and miniatures, um, they are very uh, sh shaky to uh, interpret, you know, because we cannot exactly um, no, the analogy of uh, the seal to the human body. Um, but I think that the reason why um, we, we, so we have the kite seal before, before 1204, when Byzantines were um, still using their own style and uh, in weapons and in arms. And then we have Byzantine armies after 1204. After 1204, when is the period that this shield I made belongs? We are copying. Uh, we're simply copying Western medieval European armors, armor and weapons. So exactly. this is a combination of uh, because it is medium in size and it is not large like the earlier Norman kite shields, um, and it is also. Uh, keeping the shape of the oval at the top, which uh, we take from uh, uh, hagiographical evidence. But we also have triangular shape so, mm -hmm. from the same period. So yes, my answer is that we were copying, it was a period, um, 13th century onwards, is a period that the Byzantines were adopting uh, more or less 100% uh, Western European weapons. Yeah, during the Crusades. Yes, um, because um, the line of production had been broken. They were uh, relying more on imports than in uh, local production. But maybe they were still trying to um, maintain their own, you know, cultural impact and uh, style. So this is why you see in some um, icons the, the oval shape of the top, but ends up to a point below. Oh, thank you. It's a, very interesting. Um, and in this case, also for weapons. Uh, another uh, question would be: um, You've focused the um, focus the Spartan that you have one that you uh, talked yes. about this, and my question would be. Uh, would be why uh, why uh, did uh, sooner uh, sooner uh, later did the uh, Byzantine use another sword uh, the Paramarian? Uh, could you tell us um, when did happen yes. in, or why? The Paramarian is a sword that uh, some uh, historians interpret uh, to be 
uh, not necessarily curved, but uh, straight. So parameterian is actually a, so, a, a term, a terminology to describe the fact that the swords were hanging from the hip, from the left um, hip of the soldier, because paramirion means by the hip. So uh, while it is a term that has been uh, associated with the uh, suburb yes. blades, maybe, maybe that's not the, entirely the case. There is a strong uh, probability that Paramirion was also uh, the straight uh, sword that I am using and I am presenting. You know, so. But oh, it's in but this this sword ended again in twelve oh four. Those Byzantine swords um, died. You know, with the old. Uh, Byzantine Empire after World after War. The, the Fourth Crusade. Yes, um, and that was uh, the reconquest uh, happens in the different uh, you know, different weapons. And um, when the reconquest happens, and again, this is a hypothesis. We don't exactly know for certain, but we can we can see the trend. We can see that how things develop. So by the time we take back Constantinople, Byzantines had already begun to adopt Western European weapons, arms, and uh, techniques. Uh, allow me just to ask you a few questions. And um, this is a bit more uh, entertainment. Uh, but it would be, for example, if you would have to go into a sword fight with no armor, what would be your pick of sword? I will definitely uh, pick a sword, any kind of uh, single-handed sword, and the shield. Well, okay, good style. Yes, that that uh, my style based on uh, my experience and uh, through that experience, uh, what suits me as a person. And um, a few other questions, which we, uh, for example, can you give us three reasons uh, for me and other people that are following your channel? What, why should we saw your channel and why? So three reasons. I think that, uh, and I am inviting everyone to follow my channel because I want to share with people, um, Greeks and also international audiences, everybody that is interested I want to share uh, my insights on Byzantine history, military history, and reenactment. I honestly believe that I have um, very interesting things to present. Uh, my uh, to share my insight on how on how to what methodology uh, we should use, and it is not about making big discoveries because most of the stuff is either already discovered or there is not much to be discovered that already is not known. Um, so it's not about making big discoveries, but it is about interpreting what we already have as known facts, interpreting those facts in the proper way. Um, and I also think that because um, visiting uh, military history is a subject that, yes, there is a lot of interest already uh, developing in internationally, but as yet, we do not have uh, enough uh, uh, appearance on YouTube, if I may say so. and. Uh, definitely not enough from English speaking. Uh, no. <laughs> we'll, we'll, do, we'll, we'll be focused on it and see if it goes growing and uh, more. And uh, by the way, um, could you uh, tell us what's going to be the next uh, title of your next video or end topic? 
Okay, the next video, which I do not want to promise, to make big promises about how early it will be, uh, but uh, at some point uh, in the near future, I want to pre make a proper presentation of, uh, of my 14th century Byzantine armor. Which, oh. again, I think it would be interesting to a lot of people. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll be looking at it. <laughs> And hope all the best. Thank you very so, much, uh, Jonas. For me, this is it. I uh, thank you very much for your time. Um, thank you very so, much, Ray, for having me on uh, your channel. Of my my best, all my best.